Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses as we conclude with part 14, the new philosophy of Orders of the Great Work by Manly P. Hall. The new philosophy. It is said that the age of modern chemistry began with Robert Boyle, 1629 through 1691. Boyle was born the year that Francis Bacon is reported to have died and was intimately associated with the Royal Society, which was dedicated to the extension of Bacon's scientific concepts. Bull was the seventh and youngest son of Richard, Earl of Cork, and was born in Lismore in Ireland. He received an academic education at the University of Leiden in Holland, and afterward traveled extensively in France, Switzerland, and Italy. He settled in the University of Oxford about 1657 devoting his attention to experimental philosophy and chemistry. He frequented the Society of Virtuosi, which met in the lodgings of Dr. John Wilkins. After the restoration of King Charles II, this society was enlarged to form the Royal Society, which will be discussed in the next part of this work. Boyle has been described as the greatest promoter of the new philosophy of any among them referring in this instance to the members of the Royal Society. The disciples of modern chemistry like to assume that Bull was emancipated from the chimera of alchemy and other superstitions which had dominated the speculations of his predecessors. The facts, however, scarcely support such conclusions, for this distinguished savant of the phlogistic theory was not only profoundly learned, but was also deeply devout. He was versed in Hebrew and other Oriental languages and was a profound student of the rabbinical writings. He was equally informed in the works of the early church fathers and has been called a true master of the whole body of divinity. His capacities in mathematics, geography, navigation, history, and metallurgy are too well known to require examination. Dr. Peter Shaw was fully persuaded that Bull believed in the possibility of the Philosopher's Stone and that the illustrious Dr. Edmund Holly questioned Bull directly on the subject. The chemist declared that though he thought the Grand Elixir was difficult to be obtained, yet he did not imagine it impossible. In the Philosophical Transactions from February 1676, there appears an article by Bull titled An Experimental Discourse of Quicksilver Growing Hot with Gold. Referring to alchemical transmutations in this article, Bull wrote, through God's blessings, my trials afforded me positive proof about the year 1652. Bull's stand in the philosophical transactions resulted in a lengthy letter from Sir Isaac Newton to the secretary of the Royal Society. Newton was courteous, but skeptical. I question not, wrote Newton, but that the greatest wisdom of the noble author will sway him to high silence, till he may be resolved of what consequence the thing may be, either by his own experience or the judgment of others, that thoroughly understanding what he speaks about, that is, of the true hermetic philosopher, whose judgment, if there be any such, would be more to be regarded in this position than that of all the world besides to the contrary. Newton, a fellow member of the Royal Society, was himself deeply immersed in mystical speculations. The catalogue of his library indicates his taste for alchemy, Kabbalism, and even astrology. The first English edition of the Fama and the Confessio of the Rosy Cross, with marginal notes in Newton's autograph, was offered for sale by an English book dealer a few years ago. It is only fair Therefore, to bear in mind that the transition from alchemy to chemistry was neither rapid nor abrupt. The new philosophy of Bacon intensified the interest in scientific methods, but was not responsible for the drift towards materialism, which dominated higher learning in the 18th and 19th centuries. The material advancements in science and the social and political changes affecting the minds of men generally 
obscured the sublimer part of the hermetic tradition. Alchemy ceased as a dynamic force, and the art passed from public notice. Investigation will prove, however, that the genuine exponents of the new method were also proficient in the old method. With them, a division was taking place in their own minds. Spiritual convictions were coming to be regarded as private matters and scientific convictions as public concerns. Discretion dictated this policy. The exponents of the new method were most intolerant of earlier doctrines and concepts. To be convicted of metal sympathy for the esoteric tradition was to hazard reputation and estate. It seemed more prudent, therefore, to follow the example of old Bishop Sinaus of Alexandria, who conformed openly with the prevailing opinions, but remained a philosopher in the private parts of his own mind. The European adepts, fully aware of the rising tide of social changes, altered the place of their habitation, that is, the vehicle for the perpetuation of their several purposes. The mystical chemical societies slowly disintegrated as the initiates quietly withdrew their guidance and support. The sciences had been launched in a straight, if narrow, way. A new emergency was inevitable. Human society must be prepared to receive the impact of a vast scientific program of physical accomplishment and its consequences. Skill without sufficient ethics could launch a monster of Frankenstein upon an unregenerate mankind. Hence, the pressing need for immediate reforms in religion, politics, and economics. Mr. Bull had the ease and security provided by an adequate fortune. He further simplified his life by taking residence with his sister, for whom he had a deep attachment and who relieved him of all responsibility for the management of his estate. This sister, Catherine, Countess of Rain Lath, was distinguished for her attainments and the generosity of her nature. It is said that she never engaged in any enterprise except for the good of others. Through her ministration, Bull was able to pursue his researches with no personal interruptions for some 40 years. For most scholars, however, the times were difficult and uncertain, and the advancement promised by science could not be generally enjoyed without a broad and deep program of social reformation. The adept fraternities, operating secretly both in Europe and in England, set up the machinery of what we shall call the orders of universal reformation. Certain outstanding intellectuals, widely separated geographically, enjoyed a simultaneous change of mind. More correctly, we should say a simultaneous change, not of the substance, but of the direction of their thinking. Most of these ethical reformers had already gained distinction as alchemists and hermetic philosophers. Many are known to have belonged to earlier secret societies. In their writings, the old symbols, emblems, and designs reoccur, but a new meaning is ascribed to each. After about 1650, the literature of alchemy consists principally of reprints from earlier works or interpretations by those attempting to penetrate the obscure symbolism. After 300 years, an interest in alchemical speculation has been revived by the finding of modern physicists and chemists. Sir William Ramsey, writing in 1904 on radium and its products, said, If these hypotheses concerning the possibility of causing the atoms of ordinary elements to absorb energy are just, then the transmutation of the elements no longer appears an idle dream. The philosopher's stone will have been discovered, and it is not beyond the bounds of possibility that it may lead to that other goal of the philosophers of the Dark Ages, the elixir vita. The vindication of the hermetic art is by no means unlikely. When this comes to pass, perhaps there will also be thoughtfulness for that high transmutation in the ethical sphere, which was the purpose of the Universal Reformation. Carl Jung has recognized that the symbols of alchemy are the characters of a language of the human unconscious. Through such figures, deep and abiding instincts and impulses rise to the surface of consciousness. 
The opening years of the 17th century brought such an emergence. Deep mystical convictions pertaining to the eternal and internal nobility of man emerged through the ancient figures and emblems. The Mutus Liber, the book without words, released a new degree of its secret meaning. The world moves, men grow, arts and sciences unfold, but the guardianship of the race must go on. Progress does not deny the old symbolism, nor does it exhaust the hidden meaning. The transmutation of metals prepared the way for the transmutation of man himself, and all the institutions which he has divested. While physical chemists seek to bind the universe to the human need, the hermetic adepts strive unceasingly to fit man to be a wise and faithful steward in the house of the universal mystery. Thank you for watching, and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Rosies. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description.